is the Metropolis algorithm, which in order to approximate um, say the volume of a convex body in high dimensions, it's the only sort of approximate um, polynomial time algorithm that we know of. Um, it's a remarkable algorithm. It was voted one of the top ten algorithms of the century, of last century. Um, so it will be very useful to know that algorithm. And variations of that algorithm include things like Gibbs sampling, which probably if you do deep learning you've come across the term, or if you do biology, or if you do statistics. Um, and also will lead us to understand Hyper Monte Carlo, which is a very popular algorithm that combines Monte Carlo and sampling in order to do Bayesian inference in uh, neural networks. So this will allow us to attack problems like neural networks from a completely different uh, perspective. And again, where the Bayesian methods are very good is in getting confidence intervals and so on. If you want to do a robust analysis, if you want to, where you want to put all your prior assumptions and where you want to um, verify that those priors, um, that your intuitions are right by looking at uh, data and predictive tests, um, then you know, the Bayesian scheme is ideal for that. Um, but the problem is it requires the solution of integrals that we can't do by hand. Fortunately, um, when we do sampling, we will be able to solve those integrals. So that's what sampling is going to give us. Uh, it's going to give us, it's going to give us the machinery for doing Bayesian inference. Sampling, um, that is Monte Carlo, is to Bayesian inference but optimization is to maximum likelihood or penalized likelihood. Okay. So you either think of the problem as an optimization one where you have a likelihood and a regularizer and you crunch an optimizer or you think of the problem as an integration one where you have also likelihood and a prior but where you need to get the normalization constant in order to get the posterior and the normalization constant is essentially an integral and that um, uh, that's intractable and so we resort to something. Okay, so let's um, review some of um, this material. So in the last class, uh, in logistic regression, uh, we went over what the likelihood was for the logistic regression. Um, it's Bernoulli because essentially we're trying to decide whether the labels will be binary, um, zero or one. Um, so the success probability pi i is essentially the probability that y i will be equal to 1 and then 1 minus pi i is the probability oops it would be the probability of um, it being 0. Um, then in Bayesian inference um, guys thank you in Bayesian inference we assign a prior to the weight and if I put a Gaussian prior and you look at, you take the negative log of that prior and you'll see that um, a Gaussian prior is just essentially a ridge regularizer in the, in the optimization context. If I wanted, um, if instead of putting a theta squared that in the exponent of the Gaussian, I had an absolute, the sum of the absolute values of the thetas, then I would get an L1 regularizer. And I could even do what we did for um, autoencoders and um, have a, a prior that matches what we do, um, what we did in autoencoders. Those priors are usually called spike and slab uh, priors. It's sort of a bit more advanced. We're not going to go into them, um, but they're there. But for simplicity, we're going to put a Gaussian prior. We essentially, uh, with that Gaussian prior, we typically have mu being equal to zero. And so essentially what we're saying is we want the thetas to be small. Or we believe the thetas that are zero are the most probable ones. Because the, the Gaussian prior centered at zero just essentially is telling you higher probability at zero. Okay, so in order to compute a posterior, all we do is we multiply the likelihood times the prior and we normalize over theta. And the reason why we normalize over theta is because the posterior is a distribution of a theta <coughs> given x and y, which are the data in this case. 
Now, solving that integral for that particular likelihood that we have on the screen in that particular prior is intractable, something we can't do by hand. And um, so we have to resort to uh, numerical compu computing. So we have to figure out a way, a smart way of solving um, that integral. So this is the setup for all Monte Carlo problems in Bayesian statistics. You have a likelihood, you have a prior, you don't know Z. And so where Monte Carlo always comes in is to give us an approximation of Z. Okay, or later on, as we will see, it will just give us, um, without having to approximate Z, it will allow us to approximate interesting properties of the posterior, which will allow us to do Bayesian prediction, which is sort of an ensemble type prediction. Okay, so questions at this point, because the, the next 10 slides are from extensions of this slide. to know Z, like we're just maximizing the posterior, that's equivalent to maximizing the likelihood. So I take it we're not maximizing the posterior, are we like, is it when we're like no. integrating with the posterior, like finding the mean posterior? Uh, what we're going to find is the whole posterior. We're going to, what we're going to try to do is to do a histogram approximation of the posterior. So instead of believe, um, so when we, um, if you take, if you think about the negative log posterior, the negative log P of theta given X and Y um, and if you think of it in terms of optimizing in terms uh, will essentially give us a constant because Z does not depend on theta. For these particular models, Z is independent of theta. There are models in machine learning where that's not the case, like, uh, like Boltzmann machines restricted, Boltzmann machines, which some of you might have encountered before in deep learning. But in this case, we're not concerned with those models. So Z is a constant in terms of theta. Z is not a function of theta. And the reason why it doesn't depend on theta is because we're integrating out theta. If we integrate our theta, we're just removing the effect of theta with fine marginalization. So we would get a constant, and then we would get the minus the negative log likelihood of P of Y given X comma theta minus um, the log of P of theta. And so that's just a constant. Okay. The negative log likelihood would just be minus the sum from i equal 1 to n of essentially the cross entropy yi log pi i plus 1 minus yi log 1 minus pi i. And then in addition, with if the mean is zero, we would have this regularizer, which is minus one over two sigma squared norm of theta squared. Okay? That's if we just take the negative log likelihood of the posterior. So as a function of theta, what we're saying is, if, if we want to do, when, do logistic regression by optimizing, what we would do is we do gradient descent um, on exactly that, uh, that objective function. Um, if you just consider the, ent the, the cross entropy as you did in your homework, um, you know how to compute a gradient of that. If you want to regularize the model by saying, I want some of the features to be small, because I want the inputs to the neural network, if they're not too influential, I want them to go to zero. In which case, you would just add that uh, theta squared. The parameter sigma in this case is essentially what lambda was when we discussed rich regression. So essentially, by adding a Gaussian prior, you're just adding a rich regularizer to logistic regression. And the same works 
the same would work for neural networks. So um, when we sample from the posterior, do we? Yeah, we haven't done that. That's what this class will be about. Uh, at this point, I'm just trying to make the connection of just making sure that you understand what is the prior here, why is the likelihood, why are we setting a prior that is a Gaussian prior, and I'm trying to argue that the Gaussian prior makes sense because it's just saying that um, you want your thetas to be small, so you're putting a, a rich regularizer on your problem. And there's two ways to approach the problem. The way that we know so far is we would just do the gradient of that objective function, that j of theta, and then we just do gradient ascend and we find one single theta, one theta. And that theta that we find, that's our answer. The Bayesians will not believe in a single theta, you will find many thetas. There's not going to be a single answer, there's going to be many answers. Just very much like when we do a forest. We take many, each tree is an answer, and then we combine them. So this is going to be that way. All right, so I'm going to proceed to move on to the sampling. Okay. So key to this is the fact that we need to compute the normalization constant, which is the integral of the likelihood times the prior The trick we're going to follow is we're going to multiply and divide by a distribution Q of theta. Now that distribution could be, for example, Q of theta equal, um, I don't know, typically you, you want something with heavy tails, but let's just say that it's a Gaussian which has a huge variance. Okay, so this Q of theta you get to choose. As a user of a Monte Carlo method, you will design a Q of theta. I will give you next some insights as to how to design this Q of theta, but for the time being, assume you can pick a Q of theta. Okay. Assuming that we have a Q of theta, then what we do next is we rename quantities here. This ratio here, we're going to call W of theta. Okay? Now, you can evaluate W of theta because Q of theta is a Gaussian, so you can evaluate, given a theta, you can evaluate a Gaussian. Uh, moreover, the likelihood is Bernoulli, so you can plug in a theta and get the value of the likelihood for that theta. And the prior is also a Gaussian, so you can plug in theta and see what value you get for that Gaussian. So we can evaluate W of theta. And that's an integral with respect to Q of theta d theta. What we're going to do next is we're going to use our computer to draw samples. So you go to your computer and you say, give me um, N, capital N, samples, and let those samples be the zero mean and have a variance um, sigma squared of uh, 1,000. So any computer program can generate samples from a Gaussian distribution, and we've seen before how we do that by using the cumulative of the Gaussian. So in math, we just say we're drawing samples from Q of theta for I equal 1 all the way to N using Python notation. And so what I do next then is I replace an expectation with respect to Q of theta 
because this essentially is the expectation of W of theta with respect to Q of theta by a sample average. Okay. So we're used to flipping coins and using counts, that is sample averages, to estimate the expectation of, say, the coin being hit. Here we're going to do it the other way around. We're going to take an integral and we're going to replace it by a sum. So in other words, I flip this coin n times and I'm replacing I'm replacing the expectation with a sample average. And that's essentially is what Monte Carlo is in terms of uh, solving integrals. Any sample average converges to an expectation and that's just a consequence of the strong law of large numbers. Okay, the law of large numbers just says an average converges to an expectation. It's sort of a very classical result that is uh, more than 100 years old and it's in Wikipedia. Go ahead. Um, does the choice of distribution for Q affect anything with uh, this method? Yes. Uh, it does indeed. Um, some cues will be very nice, either cues will be, be, be very bad. I'm going to come to tell you what would make a good cue very soon. But for now, let's assume we do have a good cue. If you do have a good cue, let's just accept that uh, we'll be fine. Okay. Um, I have a few plots where I show different cues and that will allow us to see the effect of Q on this. Okay, so let's look at this a bit more in detail. What we're essentially doing is we're coming up with a bin approximation of the posterior. Let's uh, bring this picture here. So essentially in Bayesian, in um, an important sampling, we, um, and here in 1D, I can actually do numerical computation very precisely so I can actually compute the posterior. So what I did is I took some data and then I did quadrature in order to compute the posterior distribution and I plot the posterior there. Note that the posterior is not Gaussian. The right hand side is a bit higher than the left hand side. Um, and that's a consequence of the likelihood being a Bernoulli likelihood, it's no longer um, um, the, the likelihood in logistic regression is not Gaussian. It's a product of Bernoulli's and it has that particular shape um, that is shown there. If I was doing maximum likelihood, the answer would be that theta that at where the likelihood is maximum. So this is a function of theta. If I was doing now let's say I'm doing maximum likelihood with a ridge prior. What would the answer? What would the answer be? A number. Two. Two. Good. Because essentially this is the posterior, the location of the maximum of the posterior. That would be, which is to say around two. That's going to be the the estimate. In this case, I also generated the data from the model, so I know the true theta. And the true theta is actually 2. Neither the maximum likelihood nor the posterior estimate, which we often call the theta map. So this guy here, this value, this value over here is what we call the theta map. or maximum a posteriori. None of these two gave me the right theta, the true theta, the generated data, which was two. What would have to happen for these methods to converge to the true theta? What, are, what is it that we know about maximum likelihood? When does maximum likelihood converge?
Let me rephrase this. Why do we bother to do maximum likelihood? Why does maximum likelihood make sense? The limit of When the data is Gaussian. But in logistic regression, the data is binary. And I argued and gave a homework asking you to compute the likelihood. So if the data is Gaussian, it works. But it works in other distributions. Someone had another. In the limit of infinite sampling? Pardon? Infinite samples? Infinite samples. Infinite samples. Samples of what? If you kept on recomputing the posterior. Like using the posterior as a prior and when right. it samples of data, you mean? Yeah. That was the result. We have an exam coming up in two a week. Less than less than two weeks. Make sure you revise your slides. The result for maximum likelihood. The reason why we do maximum likelihood is because as n goes to infinity, as the data goes to infinity. If I had a bigger data set, then that theta ML would concentrate on two. But I have a five small data set. When you have a small data set, the best maximum likelihood answer is not necessarily the true mechanism that generated the data. I need to, there's variance in this. It does put some probability in it. It's not dumb. Maximum likelihood is saying there is some probability that this is the right value. That whole distribution is really the likelihood. It's telling me how much each theta is worth as a solution to the problem. And we usually pick the one that has the highest value. We pick a single one. But it's only as the data grows that maximum likelihood converges to the true solution. Maximum likelihood also made sense because I argued that when you do maximum likelihood in different settings, um, it's equivalent to matching the statistics of the world with what you imagine. That's another good reason for, to, to think of why you do maximum likelihood. You're just trying to match the model um, to reality. The theta map takes into consideration the likelihood. So it basically takes this guy here, which is the likelihood. It multiplies it times this guy, which is the prior. And that gives us the posterior. And then you just sum over all the area under the posterior to make sure that it sums to one. And that's how I compute the posterior. Now, as, this, as the proposal distribution, I decided to use an arbitrary distribution Q of theta. And that's the distribution that I'm showing there with the dashed line. I just pick you know, sort of a Q that is very flat. When I try to do Monte Carlo estimation, what I will be able to do is get an approximation of the posterior. That approximation will not be based on a single theta. It will be actually a full histogram, as you can see here by these yellow bars. It's a whole approximation to the posterior. That's the Bayesian solution. And why does it make sense? It makes sense because precisely like in this example here, um, the, there is very little distinction between theta equal 2 and theta equal 3 in terms of the quality of the, what they can offer you. It's important to keep in mind that there is uncertainty. The posterior, through its volume, through its variance, is keeping track that there is uncertainty in your estimate. Now, how do I write? So essentially, what I'm going after is that yellow histogram, which is the posterior distribution. How do I write down a histogram in math? Uh, one way to do it is to do the following. I'm going to say that the posterior of theta given the data, which in logistic regression are the x's and the y's, will be equal to, uh, first I'm going to make this claim that it's going to be sum of 1 over n, i equal 1 to n, um, and 
the weight theta i and then I'm going to introduce a function that's the delta function and what this function will do is it will count how many samples of theta fell in the interval um, d theta. So let's write that down delta theta i d theta is equal to the number of samples theta i in the interval d theta. Okay. Now the sort of picture to have in mind here is let's assume that theta is one dimensional. We have a posterior that looks like this. The posterior need not be Gaussian. It could be any distribution. For the neural network, it's more likely that it will look like that than, than Gaussian. Even if the likelihood is Gaussian, that's because you have nonlinearity. Nonlinearity in the likelihood combined with the prior gives rise to a non-Gaussian posterior. I'm going to now make a slight important concept precise, what we mean by density and what we mean by distribution, what we mean by probability as opposed to the density function. I'm going to say that this curve, P of theta, given the data, is what we call the density or the probability density function. I'm going to next consider the interval d theta. So I'm going to pick an interval d theta whose width is indeed d theta. This area here is the probability. Okay, probability is defined as the area under the density. Okay, if you have a Gaussian distribution and you look at the area under the first half of the Gaussian distribution, what is that area equal to? Uh, a half, right? So the probability of a Gaussian number being less than zero for a Gaussian that has mean zero is a half. So probability is the area under the curve of the density. In other words, probability, which we're gonna, I'm going to write as d theta, and now I will be a bit more precise and put a d theta, because we measure probability on intervals. We measure the probability in areas. That's why um, two weeks ago when I asked you to consider this experiment of darts where you were throwing darts and I asked you what's the probability that you're going to hit this, the dashed area, the square or the circle or the wiggly. Uh, we always had to measure the areas because probability in continuous spaces, in the Euclidean spaces, is assigned to areas. So it's assigned in this case in 1D to lengths, uh, to intervals d feet. And the probability, sort of using here a very loose ap approximation, is essentially the height of the interval, which is p of theta. Um, and I should condition all this on data, given data, given data, times the interval length. Okay? So the area is the probability. The height is the density. The width is the length of the interval, which we also call the measure. Okay, so what this now is doing is we're saying the probability is being approximated by 
if these are the samples, what we're essentially doing is we're counting how many samples fall in each interval and then the height um, is dict dictated by how many samples fell in each interval. And that's how I compute those yellow bars next. I just draw a bunch of samples and then I just do a histogram of those samples and that gives me an approximation of the posterior distribution. I'm just counting how many samples fall in each interval. So I need to choose the interval <coughs> in doing this. And, uh, and that's essentially um, how we approximate a distribution in Monte Carlo. Okay? Typically we, in high dimensions we try not to do this because if I was trying to get an approximation of the posterior high dimensions, I would still need in 2D, I would need a grid of n squared points and in 3D I would need n cube discretizations and in D dimensions I would uh, need n to the power d. So again, um, doing this is subject to the curse of dimensionality if what I'm interested in is in approximating the posterior distribution. But most of the time, we don't care actually about approximating the posterior distribution. What we care about is doing some prediction. So we will be able to beat the curse of dimensionality that way. So we're not going to do this histogram. Um, from who's done here measure theory or math, if undergrad math? So for you, this measure would be the Lebesgue measure. So in probability actually I'm treating these integrals as Riemann integrals um, and for this class it's okay. Think of it as Riemann integrals like the sort of Riemann integrals you learn in calculus. Um, but it, um, this notation P d theta happens quite often. It actually means something slightly different. It's called the Lebesgue integral and it's, it's kind of like the Riemann integral except that it's Instead of summing what, like this, you're summing over sets that involve y intersections. And there is a reason for that, because you can easily construct functions for which the Riemann integral actually doesn't converge. So the integral is not well defined, whereas the Lebesgue integral is well defined. But we're not going to go into the, those details. So we're simply going to assume that uh, we're in the Euclidean space where everything is nice. And in, practice in machine learning, your, your usual will be in the Euclidean spaces or discrete spaces. Okay. The other thing we can do then to beat the curse of dimensionality is um, know that what we usually care is about making a new prediction given a new input and given a data set, y1 to t and x1 to t. So if you have t labels in your training set and t inputs in your training set, given a new input t plus 1, you want to make a prediction. In order to make a prediction according to Bayesian uh, inference, we need to integrate out over all the possible values that the posterior could take. So then this becomes the integral of p of y t plus 1 given x t plus 1 comma theta times the probability under d theta given x1 to t comma y1 to t. And that because of this relation we just learned is what we typically write as the density times the measure. Okay. So when you're reading papers, you will often find that notation or sometimes it's dp of theta. When, when you come across the notation, you know, be aware that the authors are just making precise what's the density, what's, a, what's the probability. Now, um, that essentially removes the effect of theta because Bayesians don't like to the idea of that there's a single theta. They, need, they want to 
uh, integrate out over all the possible values that theta could take. So they want a weighted prediction. Now what I can do is I can write this as the integral of p of y t plus 1. I can approximate this. And to approximate this, I'm going to use this histogram formula, which is saying the probability that you will fall in an interval is the number of times you were in that interval, weighted by the ratio of you know, the likelihood times the prior divided by Q. And the reason why you need to wait is because the samples are not coming from P. The samples are coming from this other distribution, Q. So you need to correct with that weight the fact that your samples didn't come from P. Go ahead. Um, why is it that we don't divide by Z? Oh, because we've actually estimated um, uh, we've actually estimated Z empirically. So here we've constructed it so that the weights, um, we've actually constructed so that it's appropriately normalized. So we don't need to divide by Z. Um, I, w I will, when I do in normalize important something, I'm going to make uh, this even a bit more clear. I'll come back to your question in two slides. Uh, for now, let's assume that we have that uh, histogram estimator. If you have that histogram estimator, then what we can do is we can replace it here with the sum from i equal 1 to n. And now I'm just going to replace that expression that we had. And I'm going to do manipulation and I'm going to take the 1 over n outside the integral and I'm going to take the sum outside the integral. Now, what this integral is saying is sum over all thetas, but only consider the interval d theta. So only look at the where, um, so only look at this infinitesimal small sample d theta. Now, when you integrate, delta is essentially a Dirac measure. It's essentially a spike at theta i. So if I'm multiplying a distribution that has whatever shape times a spike, I'm just going to basically be evaluating the distribution at the spike. It's a sort of um, a result that many of us have seen before and have studied before. And so this is essentially p of y t plus 1 given x t plus 1 comma theta i times w of theta. Okay, so in this case, I'm able to compute a predictive distribution, which essentially is the likelihoods, because this is nothing but the likelihood. But weighted by how probable it is. It's weighted by W. So if a sample has high posterior probability, the contribution of the likelihood term will be higher. Okay. And that's essentially the Bayesian solution. The Bayesian solution take, take an average of all the predictions, the predictions are the likelihoods weighted by W of theta. And for a Bayesian, you don't predict a single value. You predict a distribution because when you have a distribution, 
you can you know the variance, you, you know how likely each theta is, not just the one theta that you chose. And this in bioinformatics is very important because if you're trying to fundamentally say, make an observation about either a patient or a fact about biology, you don't want to just publish that fact without taking into consideration that you have a very flat distribution and you actually don't know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. That's what it boils down to. You need to know the uncertainty um, when you're talking about any scientific fact and that's what makes scientists scientists, that we can actually uh, make uh, informed arguments and decisions. So it's important in, in bioinformatics to do this type of analysis. Um, now, coming back to the question that was asked before, most of the time in Bayesian um, inference we don't know the normalization constant, P of theta. And so in logistic regression we actually have to do something slightly different. I've now, what I've been, so, I've been sort of cheating up to now um, because in, in logistic regression we actually don't know the normalization con constant so it's hard to approximate the posterior. If I knew the normalization constant of the posterior then I could have used the estimates that we had um, so far. But in practice, what I have is I have my posterior density, P of theta given the data. I'm just going to use capital D for the data. Just to write less. And that's equal to 1 over Z P of uh, D given theta, the likelihood, times the prior, say Gaussian. And so and that's also equal to P of D given theta times P of theta divided by the normalization constant which is the integral of the numerator. Okay. So let's assume now that I want to compute um, any expectation. The predictive distribution is just one expectation. It's the expectation of the likelihood. Um, let's do the predictive distribution. P of y t plus 1 given x1 to t plus 1. That's the integral of P of y t plus 1 given and actually y1 to t. I'm going to write it in yet a different way which will okay. so the predictive distribution is what's the new y given the new x and given the date that we had it doesn't use a theta because we're integrating over theta um, and so that's going to be the likelihood times the posterior and then the posterior now is p of d given theta times P of theta and in fact Z does not depend on theta so I can take it out. Right? So now I can rewrite this as the integral of P of Y T plus 1 given X T plus 1 comma theta times P of D given theta times P of theta and I'm going to divide and multiply by Q of theta so I haven't done anything when I do that and then since Z was taken out I'm going to now expand Z and Z is just the integral of P D given theta times P of theta theta. And in fact I'm going to do one more thing in this line which is I'm going to do the same trick as I did above. Multiply and divide by Q of theta. Okay. So in other words this whole thing is equal to the integral of P of 
y t plus 1 given x t plus 1 comma theta times w of theta times q of theta d theta divided by the integral of w of theta times q of theta d theta. This derivation right now is the most important derivation important something. For Bayesian statistics this is the one you need to know. This is the most important page. Because in, in Bayesian sum a normalized important sampling is used a lot in say graphics and so on. But in statistics you never know the z. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be approximating two integrals at the same time. We're approximating the integral for z of theta and if we're doing the predictive distribution there's also an integral over the posterior. On, and so we actually are approximating the ratio of two integrals at the same time. And then what we do is we apply Monte Carlo to each of them. So we're going to apply Monte Carlo to the top and we're going to replace that by the sample average. And we're going to apply Monte Carlo at the bottom as well. And we're going to uh, use the sample average. And that's it, because that was our estimate of Q of theta. So we're just replacing the two expectations with respect to Q of theta with sample averages when the samples are coming from the distribution Q of theta. Okay? And this we can simplify a little bit more. Now we can get rid of the 1 over n. And in fact, and now this sort of will answer the question that was asked before. Um, the guy at the numerator, the sum of the w of theta i's, is essentially, uh, we can change index here because the index is just an arbitrary index in the sum. So we can use j. And so since the w at the bottom and on top is the same, what we're actually doing is normalizing the weights so that they sum to 1 so that we have a perfectly weighted uh, uh, prediction with respect to this, uh, uh, an empirical distribution. And so we typically write this as the sum from i equal 1 to n w tilde where w tilde is essentially w tilde i is just essentially wi divided by the sum of a j of the wj's. W tilde of theta i times p of y t plus 1 given x t plus 1 comma theta i. Okay. So in this case it's clear where um, where essentially z has disappeared. Um, z has disappeared because I'm, I'm ensuring that my histogram my posterior in this case I'm replacing my posterior by these bins of width d theta but I'm ensuring oops I'm ensuring that each height so this would be say w1 w2 and so on I'm ensuring that the sum of these w's sums to 1. So this histogram has area 1. So it's a valid probability distribution. Okay, if you have a histogram, it's a discrete quantity. All you have to, and it's discrete, so all you have to do is divide all the heights by the sum of the heights, and you get something that sums to 1. Does that make sense now? Okay. 
And that is normalized important sampling. And you could use this to do logistic regression uh, for five, ten parameters. And if you have uh, models in bioinformatics where you only have a few free parameters, so you, you know, if you have six, five parameters, um, this is, you know, a reasonable technique to try out. Provided that you have the right Q. Now, what would be a bad Q? Can anyone think of an example of a bad Q? A uniform distribution if your theta doesn't have, that could go on forever. That's correct. So, he's realized an important fact. If my Q is, say, uniform, say, between 0 and 1, it can only propose thetas between 0 and 1. And if my true theta happens to be 2, I will never propose a theta. So, the proposal distribution must include the support of the posterior. Whatever the posterior has positive probability, then Q must have positive probability. Um, another thing is, so all these estimators do converge to the truth as the number of samples goes to infinity. They're unbiased uh, as n goes to infinity, even the normalized one as n goes to infinity. But however, they do have high variance. Okay, so there was this bias variance trade-off. They'll give you the right answer, but they'll sort of be oscillating about the right answer. Um, and it will take a long time before we can quench those oscillations. And by having a better Q, we're essentially quenching the, the, um, those uh, oscillations quick. One of the things we can do in practice, if you're using a Q that is Gaussian, is you could, for example, choose a Q that has mean let's say a scalar mu and then maybe sigma square or a vector mu and a parameter sigma square. Let's assume that you're doing this in ten dimensions. What would be a way of optimizing those parameters? Mu and sigma. Bayesian optimization. Yeah. Now someone else, what, would you, what could be an objective function? What would you be trying to minimize in order to estimate mu and sigma? This is a harder question. Is it the difference between the posterior and the Q? So that's a good, uh, you know, reasonable strategy. Um, you would want to sort of make your Q be very close to the posterior. The closer Q is to the posterior, the better chance you have of approximating the posterior. The catch there is you don't know the posterior. That's the quantity we're trying to estimate in the first place. So, but you could try to estimate, say, like, uh, do maximum likelihood to figure out where the peak of you know, just optimization to figure out where the peak of the posterior is, and then you could try to fit the Gaussian there, and then you would use that Q. Um, some folks do that. But Your privacy is a good choice for a Q. I mean, it's good to say if your prior is good. If your prior is good. How do we test someone else? Um, how do we test if we have the right model? When you're doing rich regression, how do we, do we know that we have the right model, the right complexity, lambda, the right regularizer? Cross-validation, right? So if we have test data, we're still doing logistic regression here. Don't forget we're doing logistic regression. P of D given theta is just a product of a bunch of Bernoulli's. P of theta is a Gauss. And, what, and you have a training data, and what you're trying to do is make good predictions. Now, if you have an extra data set, and maybe here you want one for testing and what you want one for validation, you keep this extra data set that you use to just tune mu and sigma square. So you adjust mu and sigma square so that your predictive distribution works well on this extra data set. So to cross validation, that's one reasonable way to do this when you have a model that's uh, where you're trying to do prediction. 
that's sort of a simple thing to do. And most often in machine learning, what we get is about predicting. So never forget about cross-validation, your biggest friend in the world of prediction. Because that's how you, when you don't know what something should be, you create a test data set and you make sure that you can predict on uh, that data set. So is that, that should... Uh, is that for a fixed end, like given a fixed amount of computation time, find the best mu and sigma? Because I feel like for yeah, any yeah. mu and sigma, you could pick an n that was large enough that it would work. Oh, yeah, yeah. If you have infinite computation and so on, then even some sigma that's not as good would, would work. There's another thing you can do, and that I haven't covered here. Um, for those of you who want a bit more sort of material, I, rec there's, I wrote a tutorial a few years ago called uh, An Introduction to MCMC for Machine Learning. Um, um, I recommend you have a look at that for more details on important sampling. Um, but one of the things we can also do Shop, microphone diagram. So one of the things we can do is we can actually um, compute an expression for the variance of the Monte Carlo. And thus I described that in my tutorial. And since what we're trying to do is minimize variance, you, know, you can actually adjust using Bayesian optimization or gradients, you can adjust mu and sigma to minimize the variance of the Monte Carlo estimate. Okay, so there's lots of cool things you can do in order to get a better cube. Use your data, use cross-validation, or use some, something you know about the problem. If you know it has high variance, then your objective is to minimize variance. Um, and typically what people do for cues is they just pick one that's heavy tail to make sure that whatever p is positive, that q is uh, positive. So a t distribution, for example, uh, works well. But again, important sampling is one of those techniques that only works in low dimension. So if you're in, you know, up to six dimensions, this can work quite well. Um, if you're interested in doing tracking, like image tracking, or if you want to work for radar um, um, defense, or trying to estimate the volatility of a market, um, if you're working in finance, then important sampling is sort of one of the key techniques that is used there. And often it's, it's done, implemented in a sequential setting, and when you implement important sampling in a sequential <coughs> setting, the algorithm is known as a particle filter or a sequential important sampling. So this is sort of very useful um, when you're in that setting. I could go in that direction now and basically teach you how to estimate volatilities in markets and so on, but instead I'm going to stick with more machine learning type topics and we're going to move on to study a technique that will work better, will allow us to attack the issue of um, uh, sampling well in high dimensions. And intuitively the reason why important sampling fails it's because important something has to have enough, Q has to have enough support everywhere where the posterior has, is high. Whenever the posterior has a high value, you want the Q to have a high value there. But beforehand, before you know what the posterior is, if you are in a thousand dimensions, basically your challenge is you want to make everywhere in a thousand dimensions have high probability. And a thousand dimensions is a vast space, huge, and so you don't have enough probability mass in your queue to uh, be able to provide enough support for the posterior everywhere uh, before you know where, where the important parts of the posterior are. And so the technique fails. Um, the alternative we're going to learn about now and in the next lecture is Markov chain Monte Carlo, and it will be a much smarter way of actually navigating that high dimensional space so that you can actually estimate the parameters. And that will allow us to attack neural networks. So if you have a neural network with thousands of parameters, we will be able to use Monte Carlo to compute a posterior distribution of such a network. The consequence of that is that the estimates, the ensemble estimates, will tend to be a lot more accurate than the maximum likelihood estimates. And in addition, we'll know the full posterior, so we will know the confidence, we will know um, a lot of things about it. What does the unnormalized refer to? What's unnormalized? 
Oh, it's what's an, uh, the normalized refers to this guy. Okay. The posterior is unnormalized in the sense that we don't know z. Mm -hmm. If we knew how to compute z, if we knew how to compute that integral um, by hand, then this wouldn't be so challenging. There are cases when you know the normalization constant and you still want it to import to something the way we did before in these slides. And that's sort of important, say, in engineering communications. Um, you know, like estimating bit error rate and channels and so on. There's a few problems out there where you, um, also in computer graphics, if you want to simulate light in a room where you do important sampling and where you know the normalization cost. But in learning and statistics, typically uh, the real challenge is we don't know the normalization cost. We can write the likelihood, we can write the prior, but we can't write the integral of the likelihood times the prior. But this trick gets around it, will allow us to solve this problem. Uh, MCMC will be just another trick to get rid of Z that will allow us to compute also a sample average approximation. Now, MCMC is based on a concept, well, MCMC, um, the first MC is, is something like a DJ thing. Now, the first MC is Markov chain, the second MC is Monte Carlo. Monte Carlo basically means approximate an integral by a, a sum, by an empirical average. Now, the Markov chain will be the mechanism by which we're going to generate the samples. Instead of using this proposal distribution Q and reweighting, uh, what we're going to do is we're simply going to start navigating the space and we're going to navigate the space using a Markov chain. Now what's a Markov chain? The best way to introduce Markov chains is to use um, one example that we're all familiar with which is the web. But let's now think of a web that has three pages. Page one, page two and page three um, and let's just say that page one points to page two, so it has a link. And in this case, it's not going to be quite the web. Um, even though what I'm about to describe is the algorithm that Google uses to write web pages. Um, X3 points to X1, 0.6 of the time, and so on. Now, I've constructed, I've normalized these so that when you add all the entries for one uh, row of this matrix, you get one. So, the way to think of this is think of this as x1, x2, x, sorry, x1, x2, x3, and what we're saying is that x1 goes to x2 with probability 1 and it never goes to itself. So x1 to x1 that never happens and x1 to x3 doesn't happen. So with the matrix, we're describing how we transition from the previous value of the previous state, that is the previous page, to the next page. And we're going to assume that the way we transition from one page to another page is probabilistic. On the web, what you do is you go to a website, you look at all the outlinks of that website, and then you flip a coin. If there were two outlinks to my web page and one outlink to his web page, you flip a coin and with probability two thirds, you come to my page. With probability one third, you go to his page. And that's pretty much what uh, Google's PageRank algorithm does. A Markov chain is such that the current page where you are, the probability that you are at a specific page only depends on which page you were before. So if I know that I'm on page 2, the probability that I'm going to be at page 3 next is 0.9. I don't need to know what the past was. I can just read it off that graph. So 
Markov essentially doesn't have, the Markov process doesn't have memory beyond just the immediate past. To, to know the value at xt, I just need to know the value at xt minus 1. Now, there is a property that I teach in 340, and this, I think it's lecture 11 in my 340 class, and you can actually go uh, over the proof there. Um, it's a very simple application of linear algebra, which, so, which shows that if the graph has some properties, which I will soon make clear, then if you take any vector whose entry sum to 1, and you multiply it by that matrix, transition matrix, T, so T is this transition matrix, so if you transition from one state to the next, if you take that matrix to some power, and if that power goes to infinity, in other words, equivalently, you start, you have an initial distribution, that's the vector mu, you keep multiplying that by the matrix T, forever, and then you will converge to a single vector. And it, regardless of what that new is, it doesn't matter what it is, whether it's 0, 1, 1, 0, or whatever vector you have, provided that it's some sum to 1, it will always converge to the same vector pi. On the web, that vector is the page rack. It's the importance of each page. Um, the 340 people are asked to implement this algorithm, but that's essentially what it is. It's just matrix vector multiplication. Um, the properties that it needs to have is that um, the graph has to be connected. So each node has to be connected to each other node. So in other words, it means that the graph has to be irreducible to subgraphs. And we call that property irreducibility. Um, the reason being that if you have two separate graphs, then if you're tra randomizing traveling in one graph, you will never be able to visit the other graph. And randomizing, by the way, flipping, flipping a, a coin to the side where you go next, going there and keep doing, keep, keep following such a trajectory, is the same as doing matrix vector multiplication, but randomizing that operation. The other property you don't want the graph to have is cycles. So cycles are bad because, as we, this picture illustrates here for this particular transition matrix, if, because it's, it's got this cyclical behavior. If you write x2, you go to x1. If you write x1, you go to x2. Um, then when you multiply any vector, let's say pi equal 1 third, 2 thirds, times that t, all it does, it swaps the positions of the third to two thirds. So that vector never converges. Okay, so it oscillates. How can we get rid of oscillation? That's an easy trick. Add a small constant to all the values in the transition. Right, so you, would add, you could add a small constant. Um, so you could make this, in other words, epsilon, maybe make this 1 minus epsilon, this epsilon, this 1 minus epsilon. And that's equivalent to just essentially adding a self-link. So provided that you added, provided that you simply add one self-link so that the node either stays or goes next, when you go to x2, you have to flip a coin. The moment you're flipping a coin, you're breaking a cycle because it's going to be random now. You're no longer trapped in a cycle. That solves the problem. Um, so the Google guys, essentially what they do is they first they construct a matrix. And it's an extremely sparse matrix. It's mostly zeros with ones indicating the link where you're going to go next. And then they add just a small epsilon to every entry to ensure that one, that the graph is fully connected, so it's irreducible, and two, to ensure that it's aperiodic. And once they have that matrix, the rest is just matrix vector multiplication. Except you do it in a smart way. Um, and, and that's how Google ranks results for you. There's a few other heuristics that go into the index, but that's the key important thing is indeed to this day page rank. 
Um, there's a very nice package for building a search engine. Um, you know, Apache has free software. So you can download Lucene and Solar. This is software that's available to all of you. And you can easily build a search engine using that software. Um, that is, you know, can index uh, a billion pages or so. In. Except there's little reason to build a search engine these days, as big can tell you. All right, so let's assume that, so the consequence that you take any vector, multiply by t, and eventually will convert to a pi, is that once you're in the limit, if you have a distribution pi, and you multiply by this matrix t, it will, you'll still get pi. Another way to say this is that you have an eigenvector equation where you essentially say that 1 is the eigenvalue of the um, eigenvector equation. You know, ax equal lambda x, except that here a is d and x is pi. So pi is a probability vector indicating the probability of each web page, and t is just a matrix telling you how you transition from one to the other. And this is also saying that the page rank, the value of a page according to Google, is essentially the eigenvector of the web graph. Matrix vector multiplication, component-wise, if you had three pages, so if you had a vector that was like this, pi 1, pi 2, pi 3, and you had a transition matrix that was 3 by 3, just like in our example, with three nodes in the graph, um, then we can either write things in vector notation, where you have the vector pi transpose being equal to pi 1, pi 2, pi 3, such that the sum of the pi i is equal to 1, so the probability vector. And in the continuous uh, world, that matrix vector multiplication, so your vector pi, instead of just being over a few discrete values, becomes, think of it over bins, over an infinite number of bins. So your vector becomes a function. Just like us in processes, we're now considering a vector with many, many entries, and it eventually becomes a function. And your transition kernel, which is just a probability of one value given the previous value is just a conditional probability, p of y given x. So this property of Google PageRank, that you take a vector, you multiply by a transition matrix, and you eventually convert to a vector, is the same <coughs> as um, this property, which is essentially marginalization. So in other words, if you marginalize you start with an initial distribution, you marginalize with respect to some transition matrix P of Y given X, you'll eventually converge to a distribution P of Y. Now, what we do with Markov chain Monte Carlo is we use all these facts that apply to uh, Markov chains, but we're going to flip the problem completely the opposite way. What we're going to do is we're going to assume that we have pi, and we will try to construct a t that will give us samples from pi. So in other words, we can imagine we know the page rank of each web page. We know the page rank. And if you knew the page rank of the, the probability of each page, how would you draw samples from the graph? How would you draw the random walks? Okay. And that's essentially the idea of metropolis. The way I've put it, it sounds very convoluted, but It'll be a little, the algorithm actually is only going to be about six lines. Um, and that algorithm I'll present on Friday. But to conclude, the property that that algorithm will have to satisfy is that, is this matrix vector multiplication. And in order to ensure this, all I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce this condition called detail balance. That if I make an xt and I move to xt plus 1, the process is reversible. It's the same as if I was at xt plus 1 and I move to xt. And the reason why this condition is enough is because if I integrate both sides with respect to xt, this guy will disappear. 
and so I will get what I need. I will get this the condition of the Markov chain. The algorithm itself <coughs> will be extremely simple, and basically what it's going to what I will be doing is the following. I'm going to have an answer for you. I'm going to have an answer to the problem. And then I'm going to ask you, can someone give me an answer to my problem? You will give me an answer. If it's a really good answer, I will take your answer and I will drop the one that I have as a sample back into the back. If you give me an answer that I don't like, then I just, nah, I'm staying with what I have. And I reject your answer. And if you give me something and I'm doubtful as to whether your answer is better than mine, I will flip a coin and decide whether I take yours or whether I stick with mine. That's it. That's the algorithm. Now, this algorithm, an algorithm is something, a process that takes you from xt to xt plus 1. We will be able to interpret this as the probability of xt plus 1 given xt. And in fact, this is, that algorithm is a transition kernel for a Markov chain in an infinite dimensional space, in a function space. Uh, without going into the theory, the actual algorithm is quite simple. It's just a few six lines of code, and it will work a lot better than important sample. Right? Let's uh, 